Так, так, так. Oh, we've already got some people here. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Perfect. We'll just wait for some people to arrive, but uh, I'm sure we'll get going. Good evening, Taipei. Hello, Lawrence. Hello there. Is the big bottle of water something you drink every day? Is that a conscious effort to drink more water? I wish I could give the smart answer of yes, I do it every day, but I'm not. I'm very bad at it. Uh, but for for events or when I have to talk a lot, I'll I'll put a water here because I tend to drink a lot and my mouth gets dry. So, you know, yeah, that's the honest Makes answer. Sense. I find that as soon as I fill my drink up, I drink it really quickly. So I try yeah. to like leave it a little bit further away from me because otherwise it's just going down and the inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Uganda. Palinok. Oh. A very international audience already. Your reputation precedes you, Marcus. Love it. <laughs> Okay, I'm just giving everyone a few minutes just to arrive. I think we've we've already got quite a few here, but um, we'll, uh, a couple of minutes and then we'll get going. Sounds good. Where are you based? I'm in the UK. Um, and nice. the common question is, you know, are you in London? No. <laughs> and uh, then... I kind of tell people where I am. I'm, I'm bang in the middle of the UK, the boring bit that no one seems to know where it is. <laughs> okay. You're in Munich, nice, that's nice. correct? Yes, I'm in Munich, Germany. Yes, right in the heart of wow. it. We must talk about the beer festival at some stage. Which hasn't happened for a while, and I'm, I'm like two right. streets away from where it happened. So. Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> like teasing. <laughs> awesome shall we uh shall we make a start I, th I think we've got quite a few people coming in um so hello everyone welcome to uh, the first in what we hope will be a long series of arc meets and today we're talking with marcus from buffer a senior engineering manager and uh, the purpose of this series is to introduce you to influential and inspirational speakers so someone that can help you uh, get started in your career in tech and then maybe give insights into how to progress in your career in tech so i for one am personally excited to meet marcus uh, i'll start a little bit with me uh, my name is david i work at arc obviously and I'm the head of developer relations. So it's, it's my job to look after the developers who use our platform. Uh, so what is Arc? Uh, Arc is the platform that's um, here to help developers be, the, is to, uh, to help developers find remote work as easily as possible. And we, we aim to be the easiest way for developers to find remote work. So if you haven't checked it out, uh, I encourage you to do so. Um, and we can always talk about that more in the art community. But um, for now, uh, I want to introduce Marcus. Uh, and like I said, a senior engineering manager at Buffer. Hello, Marcus. Welcome. Hello there. Hello, everyone. And I guess I'll start with the first question. Marcus, we've had a chance to uh, meet briefly a, a few weeks ago, but I didn't get the, uh, the chance to ask the question. How do you pronounce your surname? Love that you're leading with this question. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't normally like. I'm not keen on any pronunciation. I know there's the th at the end, which throws off English-speaking people. The German pronunciation is Vermut, just easy without the th at the end. But there's people who say Vermut or whatever. I, I, I don't mind. So, yeah. 
I think it's you know I, I'd ask that question early, get it out of the way. Uh, but yeah, totally, I, I, a pleasure <laughs> to welcome you, and I'm really looking forward to our chat. So, um, anyone who views your profile sees um, you work at Buffer. You're a senior engineering manager, and obviously they'd want to know how does one become that. So, let's start a bit further back. How did you get started in tech? How did this journey begin? Yeah. Great question. Um, I won't start, you know, I was born. I won't, I won't go there, but um, I was always very interested in tech, uh, especially the hardware part. That's how I went into university. I studied uh, electrical engineering, um, which, you know, being a few years in then really didn't satisfy me. I, I drifted more towards the software side of things. And at the end of university, somehow by chance, um, a friend of me of my, my hometown asked me like, hey, you know, iOS is this new thing and Android, like smartphones are coming up and this, this club, this music club that we, that we had there wanted to have like an application. Do you think you can help with this? You're technical, right? And I never did anything on iOS or Android before. I said like, sure, why not? And I bought a MacBook Air, got the iPhone 4 at the time. I wasn't too early of an adopter, but I feel like iPhone 4 is already quite, quite far out. And um, I said, cool, let's do it. You're a designer. You can design it. I'll help you kind of build this. So that was my first project while still being in university. And this really excited me so much that I continued to do this while also writing a thesis, which I got like my motivation sank like exponentially to finish my university, which I ultimately did. But I right after I did that, I continued to do to be a freelancer. So I worked with this person. He was a designer. And we worked on a few bits here and there on our own projects and some client projects that were rather small. And I was like, you know what? Everything that I can code, I'll do like a website or Facebook app, whatever, I'll, I'll try it. And then I slowly kind of got to know more people, build a stronger network. And I worked with other designers then that had more connections, even, you know, globally. And um, then at some point also built my own app that got quite big in Germany around like public transportation. Apple featured that also in the Apple stores, like the hardware store on the iPhone. Um, so that was kind of a moment for me. We didn't ask for much money in you know, selling that app, but um, it was a fun project because just two people kind of building, building something together. And that was kind of like a, a little stepping stone in and then working with bigger, bigger agencies. So at some point, then I worked with a, quite a big agency from Hamburg to work on a big app on Android and iOS. I'm the sole developer. And it was a design agency doing all the rest. That was fun. And then slowly that brought me into, you know what? I love working alone, but I'm missing kind of some team. Like I miss, you know, collaborating with someone. So then I started to work with um, a few startups here and there in Europe, one in Italy, one in Germany, and did that for a while, helped them build their applications and was kind of in their teams. And at some point that wasn't enough. You know, there was just small teams of like three to, and the other one, maybe 10 people. And while working in this way, freelancing, I already worked remotely, right? But that wasn't a thing back then. You know, remote work wasn't that known. And um, but I knew of Buffer. You know, I knew of the blog, and they did something called the Twitter chat, and I followed that along. I knew people who worked there, and I was like, "Seems like a cool company. I'll follow them." And then they had an iOS developer opening. I was like, "Hmm, you know, I'll try, but you know what? I'll never get in." And the whole process took, I think, almost six months because Buffer was still small. There were like, that was six years ago, 40 people. They didn't have a like proper hiring pipeline and all those kind of things. Right. And it took me a bit of like following up with people I know were in Buffer. Like, hey, did you see my application and back and forth? Um, and then ultimately I got the email of like, we want to make you an offer. And I was like, what, me? So that was the moment that kind of, you know, changed things for me. In, in a big way. Um, I started then as an iOS developer quickly after that had to change over into the Android team because we had too many iOS developers for the small team we were and I was able to do both. And um, yeah, that kind of set, was set in stone. And then I, by, I would say by random events that I helped along the way to get there is I got into the mobile lead role, which, you know, was meant to be leading the mobile team because we were always kind of a little bit apart from the rest of the product organization. So, you know, I started to chat to the team. What is engineering management? What can I do here? I got a coach and so on. We can go on that journey if we want to. But yeah, that 
that way I ended up uh, engine, being the engineering manager for the mobile team for quite a while. And since a few months, I'm you know leading two teams, um, both of them for people, various initiatives around um, the engineering management part and the engineering work at Buffer. So yeah, it's it's been a journey. Um, and at, at Buffer, it took me like six years to get here. Wow. And it all started with a, a leap of faith or just taking a yes. leap on something a challenge and it seems like um as you've progressed there's been a, a leap at each stage you know you've gone into the unknown and taken a gamble would you say that's an essential part of being a software developer um i think so um so funny thing i i developed or i updated our engineering career framework at buffer which is a nicely fit into that question and i think there are steps within the life of a software engineer um, you don't have to take them, though. It depends of where you want to go. I do think there's an initial, initial phase that you saw also with me of like, you know, getting very proficient in, in your language and your environment and your platform of like iOS, Android or whatever web technology you're going into. So getting very proficient in the technology and your tools. So you're focusing a lot on yourself. So I think that's the initial phase that I went through in like working with designers and then also with agencies. And then for us, that's kind of the step then from an engineer to senior engineers where you start to look outward, where it's not so much more important what you do because you're already good at what you do, but you start to look outside of like, what do the people do around you? How can I be of you know help to them and how can I move the team forward? And then there's even more of a step where you know maybe staff engineer and, and principal engineer where you start to look at, okay, how can I help the company level up, right? So I think those are the like high level steps that I... I see, and that, yeah, retrospectively, you could see also in my journey. So, I mean, you touched on it there with regard to understanding your language, your framework, um, your, the tool set you're using. But then there's also the flip side of that, which was you'd taken the time to build an app which was successful. Um, so that was evidence in itself. Which one would you value more? Would you say the app was the thing that that was the best evidence, or would you say it was the, the underlying knowledge of your language and framework? Well, I didn't know that at that time the knowledge of the framework was the good thing. Right now, looking back, I would say yes. But in the moment, of course, the app was great, and you know, also it did something because it's something in your portfolio, right? I know we're not designers; designers have like nice looking portfolios, but even your track record of projects you've worked on, right? That's that's going to help. And I do think that it somehow was both, you know, like it was helpful for my deep dive into knowledge, which now retrospectively looking at it, it definitely was building a complete app, you know, from the ground up being the sole engineer working with a designer. But it also was kind of a, a thing that I have now on my, if I would want to be an engineer and continue on the journey, I had that on my on my track record. It doesn't have to be successful, but you build something from the ground up, right? I think a lot of developers uh, or people trying to become developers you know, are competing in that market where they have maybe a qualification or uh, they come through a boot camp, those sorts of things, but they don't have anything to show. Would you say that um, having a a completed project, something you built yourself is is the way to go? Would you advise someone to, to do that, uh, to, to showcase themselves? It's a tough question, but I would say it depends where you want to go into. Like there's companies that hire very junior people, you know, people that just came out of school, out of boot camp or whatever you, you've done. And I think yeah. that's very honorable and more more companies should do that. And I do think for that, you don't necessarily have to. If you want to come into the company at maybe a higher level, I do think it's of help, especially remote, because if people can look at your work, you know, that's what counts, you know, then it, it helps you and it helps the company to understand what, what you're able to do. And again, it's not about, oh, I had this, you know, product on Product Hunt and it made so much money. It's more about like you build something on your own, maybe even, you know, it doesn't have to be like a big client project, but having something that you completed to show can never be bad in my opinion absolutely absolutely so it, now you've you've moved into the uh the, the senior level the engineering manager 
if you're now looking back, if you're looking at developers who want to uh, come and work with you or, or if you were assessing someone's profile, what are the things you look for on a developer? Mm. Um, I'm not sure if that's the answer you're hoping for, but uh, mm, of course, that person has to fit the, the let's say, technology uh, map that we're looking for, right? If we're hiring for DevOps person, it's not helpful if it, that engineer just did front end work, you know? So that's, I count that as a given, and I probably think we all know this. Like, when you apply to something, you should at least fairly be similar. It doesn't matter if you worked on React or on Next.js. Like, I do think JavaScript is fairly similar. That's not what I'm looking for, which libraries or, or frameworks you worked in. But the general gist of technology should be there. And it's what I'm looking for, um, you know, having hired a few engineers remotely, is much more how you present yourself and how you communicate because that's the way we're going to collaborate and work together, right? So um, to, you know, make that funny joke already now, but there's, I've had a few applications where people said like, why you want to work at Buffalo? It's like, oh, I want to travel around and, you know, have a good life. And I, that's the wrong motivation, you know, we're still a company and, you know, like there's still people who want to work remotely just for the sake of being able to travel, which, okay, there's people who do it, but that's not something you should rub in you know the hiring manager's face because that's not not a good motivation. So I'm looking for like how they present themselves. Are they eager? Are they motivated? You know, sometimes people just write one sentence to our application form. It's like a few questions, and they just write a little sentence of like, oh yeah, love to work at Buffer. That's it. You know, the, the 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 communication that I need here is not a novel, but I need to feel a little bit of like who you are, right? Why should I click? next or like move you to the next column in your application if you just give me like a sentence from you right so it all comes down to a little bit of writing and communication that is mostly what the first glance for me is when i look at applications do, do you think that people can can join you know your teams um, not specifically your teams but join any team and change technology do, do you feel like the person oh, yeah. is more important and then just uh, they've got the background we can jump yeah, again, a basic foundation of what we're looking for needs to be there. But we had we had even other people. There was one customer researcher who did a little learning sabbatical and went into um, design now. We had engineers, you know, now two in my team that started very front end and want to become full stack and are learning back end now. We had some people move over to the infrastructure team and learn more DevOps, more security kind of things. So in generally, that's there. Your motivation has to be there. You have to be a good engineer to prove that you're able to, you know, do the switch. But I would say that if the foundation is there and you start as a front end, want to become full stack or back end, that's not a problem. I I would say. Awesome. So you touched on it. Then uh, you've, you've interviewed quite a few developers in your time. Um, what are some of the best and worst interview experiences uh, you've had? You don't have to obviously give <laughs> names, preferably, and these can actually be your own interviews. They might might be yours. So yeah, what, what are some of the best and worst? Can you think of anything? Best and, best and worst. Um, I, I have one bad example. And um, I hate, hate, hate to do those things, but it wasn't a good uh, interview. <laughs> so I have to share it. Um, the written application was good. The English seemed fine. You know, like I wouldn't have said that. I would have said that this person speaks more English. Then we ended up in an interview and we had problems communicating because there was no common like we didn't understand each other like i tried and i pulled through a half hour of that in an interview because i wanted to give the chance but very hard very hard to communicate with someone and i know english is the language we cho choose it says that on the application right so again it comes down to communication the person must have been a great engineer but the problem is if we can't communicate i i can't evaluate the person right and that's kind of the 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 mishap that happened there of like seeing it in written. Maybe someone has help helped, you know, or using tools, but then the, the the communication was was not possible. So I think that was probably one of the worst ones. And uh, the best ones, I feel like, are the ones with engineers, with engineering managers that I hired, or even my own that feel more like a conversation where it gets deep and you really can share something about the question that gets asked and you can really feel the excitement that that person is eager 
and maybe even open and honest. You know, I'm a very open and honest person. I'm, I'm very transparent and vulnerable. So if someone says, you know what, I'm very excited. And I, as the engineer, I'll, I'll go with it. And say, so like, you don't worry, you know, like, let's have a chat for five minutes. So those moments when that vulnerability and that openness shines through, they are the, the best ones. So would you advise someone to put a bit more personality into their, yeah. say, LinkedIn profile and things to, to, in order to get the interview? And it's obviously um, paramount to show a little bit more of yourself during the interview from what you've said. But would you say having a little bit more personality at that stage would help? Yeah, even I, I don't think we, well, we add the LinkedIn profile, but for us, it was always questions on our website. But if you apply with LinkedIn, I do think there's always a chance to either write more or add a, like a, a cover letter or something. And that's, I think, where adding the personality always helps, you know, like tell them who you are. Like think about Buffer. We tend to get a lot, like for engineering and customer support roles, we get from between 300 and 600 applicants at least, you know, so there's a lot of applications we have to go through. So it's, it's not about, oh, you have to record a video and do whatever, a dance or whatever, but add a little bit of personality so we can understand who that person is. I think in that written form, that's also possible of like, yeah, you know, tell us who you are. That's basically what we want to know. Awesome. So uh, the next thing that's really interesting about your career is you've pretty much always been remote from, from what I yeah. see. And you, talk, you talked about it starting off in the freelancing um, thing and before it was officially remote, you know, before this was a thing. So what would be your best remote working tips over the years and how have they changed? By the way, a small correction. I had six months of university, uh, a six months program in Munich here where I had to work in a company with like, you know, uh, uh, how do you say, like stamping your time and everything. So I did experience it, but just for six months <laughs> was enough for me. Um, <laughs> what are some remote work tips? I mean, there's thousands, you know, like I've written about them. Or I am writing about them. Um, what can I share? Um, I feel like let's start with the basics, you know, some kind of routines are helpful because a lot of people, at least when I started out, you know, people said to me like, what, working from home, I could never do this. Like there's my TV, there's my fridge, there's my PlayStation or whatever, you know, I've never been able to concentrate, but it's actually the opposite that remote workers are much more prone to um, burnout because, you know, the laptop is here. I have Slack on my phone. I can work whenever, wherever I want to. So setting up boundaries, whatever that is for you, maybe it's routines in the morning, in the evening, maybe it's a separate room, maybe it's whatever fits your bill, you know, moving work apps off your phone or move them to a, to a far away screen, whatever that fits your bill there is, is key to set up boundaries. So work doesn't become life because we have to be our own masters in that, right? For me, it's, it's, I have a dog now and in the morning I have to go out and after six, you know, like when this ends, he's going to stand here and like, can we please go out now? You know, so um, that helps me to kind of disconnect with that busy world that, that lives in here, my work, because it's my home and my workplace. So that's, that's a very basic one that I would definitely recommend to others. Um, I mentioned the, the apps, you know, move them off your phone or like to a far away screen. Something I recently, and I think I, I haven't heard a lot of people say this, but, um, you know, for us remote workers, the calendar is actually our office door. So keep that clean and add things, add blocks, add the things that are important to your calendar because people need to know when you're there or when you're not and how they can come into your office, basically, right? So that's that's another important part that your calendar is kind of your office door. Um, other things, um, oh, there's so many. Um, you know, what I said about communication, even engineers, and I'm not sure if we'll touch on this, what skills to learn, but what was hardest for me in the transition to learn is the listening, active listening. As an engineer, if you hear a problem, you want to solve it, right? Like it's your first instinct. That's how we get trained. But for me, that was super hard becoming a manager because suddenly human problems, people problems, they take months or years. Did we lose Marcus? Did we lose me? Can anyone 
hear me? Am I still here? Just one second, everyone. We'll try to reconnect. We seem to have lost connectivity. The joys of being live. Ah, I believe it might be Marcus. So we'll uh, we'll be back. So uh, I guess that gives me a good chance to reset. Um, so for those of you just joining, we're currently speaking with Marcus from Buffer, and he's giving us um, lots of information, lots of insights into um, remote work and how to succeed as both a developer and as an engineering manager. He's a senior engineering manager at Buffer, and hopefully he's back. Marcus, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I'm sorry. I just wanted to give you a break, you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. A chance to that's, recharge. Yeah. That's the vulnerable life. and the honest life of a remote worker, right? Like internet connections drop. So there we go. Yeah. I wasn't sure so, if it was me or you. It took me a while. So it's cool. Yeah, not sure what happened, but here we are. Um, I'm not sure what you what you what you heard there. I was talking about, you know, listening and communication. Even as engineers, that being a very, very important skill in remote work because everything happens through either Zoom or in a written word. So if you can learn something learn something that's related to communication. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I definitely agree with the, you know, that when you were uh, speaking about the human um, problems and they take a lot longer uh, to resolve and you can't fix them in the same way. Uh, so Buffer's known as being, you know, a, a leader really in, in the remote um, environment. Um, what, what would you say are some of the most surprising things that you found when you joined Buffer, you know, in terms of them being ahead of the game in that respect? Yeah, first thing was, and my first day, or even it was the day before, I joined and I was in all hands and seeing 40 people in a remote Zoom meeting at that time for me was like mind blowing, you know, like, wow, this really happens. They're from all across the world. So that for me, because I've been collaborating mostly in Europe and, you know, Germany, that was mind blowing. But um, yeah, longer term, what surprised me first, I got a lot of training by being a freelancer and living in the virtual world. Like if you do that remote work, you get adjusted fairly easily, at least in the initial phase. So that was a nice surprise that I didn't have a lot of adjustment time. The other part that stood out for Buffer and that I still would say is the case today is that Buffer kind of lifts at its values, even though they ch change sometimes, right? We're very transparent, you know, like our salaries, our, our blog, like has tons of information, but also the, the value of like improving, right? We never set something in stone like the old companies did. Like, hey, this is it. This is, you know, for the next 10 years, that meeting is set in stone. <laughs> um, that's not what we tend to do, especially with remote work. You know, like, like I see it in other companies and other people that I talk to or, you know, in my day-to-day -day life that things change so fast, you know. So um, improving and getting ahead of, of the game in that way is to like experiment. We have a four-day work week right now, right? We're experimenting with that. How does that work? Maybe it doesn't, maybe it will. We had self-management phase, right? So we tried this, didn't work out, moved on, you know? So I think experimenting and questioning the status quo is so important in this new way of working because it still is. I think for a lot of people hearing the, the words a four-day work week, <laughs> their minds are exploding right now. So we, you talked earlier about, you know, could I go back to an office? Could I go back to that environment? Could you go back to a five-day work week now? I struggle with that, honestly. So let me lay that out a bit. Um, I recently talked to someone. There's multiple ways how you can look at that. Four-day work week, you can have that in five days where you work less. I heard about this, but we do it in four days, right? We have Monday through Thursday and Friday off. And what you have to consider here, because it's not all shine and glory, there's a way, but you have to also consider that you have to, or you get less work done. You know, you have only four days. Sometimes I feel like we're, pushing five days into four and sometimes i notice that and we still have to again it's an experiment you know not a lot of people have done this so i'm not saying it works perfectly but you have to consider this like it's not just oh awesome one more day but in the other days there's also stuff happening you know so um that's one consideration that i wanted to like 
get ahead, get out there. But what I honestly, and I saw this from other companies and also from people on Twitter mentioning is what I noticed is I felt like I got my life back at least a little bit. And this sounds weird, but seven days, five days is over 50% is work, right? But with three days in my weekend and one being actually not a weekend day, I feel like on Fridays, I get my errands done, you know, like I have a doctor appointment, I go there in the morning. I could do this also in, on the four days, but now they're filled with work. Um, it kind of gives me this breathing room. And then Friday evening, I notice, oh, cool. I still have two more days, you know? So that feeling is very hard to go back away from, you know? So I'm not saying I wouldn't because, you know, we, we live and we learn, but for now it's definitely enjoyable, but also we have to work on what we do in the four days, right? Our sprint cycles on a two weeks or three weeks now, because, you know, we have to get the work done in, in less time, so to say. Yeah, I think everyone's still dreaming of the four-day work week currently. <laughs> yeah, I certainly am. <laughs> so um, I wanted to ask around, you know, how, how do you manage teams uh, differently in a remote environment? But I'm guessing you've always managed in a remote yeah. environment. So, so how do you ensure everyone um is engaged inspired how do you manage your team to ensure you know communication flows now now we're talking about my passion topic here so okay how much cool. time do we have no i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> um well one thing i wanted to mention before is a lot of people think it's super different remotely it is different there are things you have to do and that's one part that's very important is remote work needs intentionality and I'll come to that in a second. But what I wanted to say is that remote work management or leadership is very similar to in-person management and leadership if you do it right. In remote work, you just notice if you're bad really quickly. If you do bad management, if you do bad leadership, it'll happen like very quickly, right? It will show very quickly because we don't have corner offices with big windows, you know, there's no status and all of those kind of things. So um, yeah, remote work needs or management needs a lot of int intentionality. We're not meeting, you know, across the room. I can't just go to you. I have to make it happen. So that's, that's where all kind of stems from. And to check on everyone, a lot of, a lot of that is also transparency, right? I'm not, I'm not micromanaging people. I, I leave them be and I chat to them once a week or maybe twice if we have a team call. But it all comes down to being the open, uh, working in the open, right? Being very transparent. So I can go into Jira or whatever tool you use and see what's going on, what's being done, right? And um, also the, 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 the part that you asked about, like how everyone's feeling and how people are doing, that's a hard part. That's hard to solve. I'm not sure it's fully solved yet because if you work, if you walk in an office, I see you coming in dancing, right? Or I, I see you coming in with a frowny face. So I get a feeling, oh, she isn't, you know, she isn't doing well or she's very happy today, you know? So that that is a hard part. What we do with that is something called traffic light check-in, which kind of helps a little bit. We have this in a written way every Monday, but also in every every meeting we do this. Like, what's your traffic light? And you can add a sentence. For example, you know, today you could ask me, oh, I'm green. Um, I have this, you know, Q&A with Arc. I'm really looking forward to it. So yeah, feeling really green. Or you could say, oh, I'm feeling orange or, you know, yellow, red because something, you know, happening in my personal life, can't just focus, you know, and that way you get an idea of what's going on. So there's a simple hack and maybe, you know, in the future there will be other ways, but again, it's intentional. We had, we, we set something up to be intentional about asking about this because I just can't see it. You know, the same almost with everything. It has to be intentional and also transparent. Those two things are like the foundation of what's going on in my work. So, so is that the, the same system that you implement? Because that's in one direction from you to your team. Uh, do you encourage the team to do the exact same thing in reverse to you to communicate oh, for sure. in the same way? The traffic light is everyone in a meeting. If it's a team call, everyone goes around. So I'll pick someone, he picks the next person. And, you know, Mondays in our written form, same way. First color check-in or traffic light check-in, whatever you want to say. Sometimes it feels like, oh, is this really necessary? Do we have to say this again? But even if it's a green, it gives me an idea what the energy is in this call, right? Like if you would have said in the beginning of our call, like I'm feeling very red, red I would have been like, oh, this, this will be a fun Q&A, you know? Like if you're not feeling the energy, you know, like 
that would have been a struggle. But in that way, I know. So it's again that transparency and the intentionality of like setting those things up. Awesome. So, so what's your thoughts on um, the whole uh, synchronous versus asynchronous communication in, in managing your team and, and in them communicating back to you? Yeah. Very hot topic, I know. <laughs> um, the short answer before is there's no one way or the other, in my opinion. You need both. And I experienced both in, it, in, it, in its extremes. Um, one of my teams was very, very asynchronous for a while. Um, we had you know, someone in Taiwan, and now we have someone in India, Germany, UK, two time zones in the US. We, could we couldn't get on a call. And I didn't want to say, well, we'll record it, and the other person watches the recording. I didn't want that, right? So we went very async, team meetings, everything async. Worked for a while, but suddenly people were saying like, oh, I missed the personal touch. I miss seeing you. Like, and that's something you can't really solve if you can't all get on a call, right? So this is still, for me, very unsolved. Um, with the team now, um, we do have you know, team syncs and all those kind of things, but we tend to mix it in a healthy way where all of the communication that can happen async happens async. Status updates, preparations for meetings, like cycle planning or uh, cycle kickoff or groom backlog grooming, all those kind of things where it's a long list of tasks or brainstorms happens async. And then we have one meeting maybe per team a week where we prepare and then use that time most successfully. And then, you know, I also have one-on-ones with all the eight people. And that's for me, the most valuable time, most valuable sync time that I have, because I get to see them only once in this place. Right. So that's why I say a healthy mix of sync and async, I think is the way forward. Um, because I, I tend to do sometimes async one-on-ones if someone can't or meeting is blocked or whatever, but it's just not the same of getting to talk to someone. Right. And this is what I said this remote work thing is still new. There's so many new tools coming out. There's Yak for audio, right? Like just sending audio message, which is partly async, but grabbing something from the synchronous world. There's other tools that help with like team bonding and those kind of things. So you have to be a little bit, you know, creative sometimes, but that's the fun also of it, right? So yeah, to answer your question, a mix between sync and async is healthy but it's not easy. Async also can be people just writing novels and not getting to the point, right? Again, the communication part. So yeah. And then also synchronous, like I just recently realized, and that's why I'm reading books and learning about this is, you know what? We actually don't get trained in handling or facilitating meetings. No one, like there's trained facilitators, I know, but people in companies and teams rarely do get trained in how to actually facilitate good meetings. And now having a few, you know, like uh, I, I asked that question now with someone in Buffalo, we're collaborating and maybe this will also be sh shared transparently, like a guide on how to actually do a good video meeting. I know there's resources out there, you know, but who reads those books? Like not everyone reads those books. So um, there's definitely things we all still have to learn. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's been one of my bugbears over the years to... I sometimes wonder there must be a better way to do stand-ups, even just to get things collaborate, collaborating more, because stand-ups tends to be those three questions that everyone dreads. The answer so quickly, yeah. today I did this, yesterday I did that, no blockers, and it moves on. And we, all you want to know is to, to know that that person's okay, to know that that person doesn't need any help or, or what's going on in their brain, you know, and maybe we can uh, find a new way to, to work on those things. Oh, for sure. Like at the beginning in one team, like we had stand-ups, I think weekly where people told what they've did in the past week. And it depends on culture and personality. There, were, there was this one person, like he basically gave us this whole backlog and I was like almost falling asleep with open eyes because how useful is that time us being on this call and someone, and not to their fault, you know, but someone giving me the whole backlog of things, like how useful is that, right? Yeah. So I, I used to do something um, uh, Monday morning. Uh, we'd get the, the whole team or multiple teams together and sit down. And when you come in, this is back in the office days, when you come in, sit down and have a cup of coffee together. And at first it feels non-productive, but after a while, everyone starts to chat. You know, maybe, maybe it's week two, week three. And then you realize that someone who works in accounts has this problem where, uh, they spend every Monday doing this very 
labor intensive job and a developer will say, oh, I'll fix that for you today and just write a quick yeah. script. And, and, you know, it's not something that was on your backlog, but you've helped someone buy a day back and it just brings teams together. And I just think the more we can do that in our department and in other departments, you know, it brings a company together. But, but there's definitely massive room for improvements for meetings and how we do. Totally. Things. And what you just yeah. said, I, I, I have to bring it back because I brought it up and, and need to sound smart, you know, but in your coffee meetup and, you know, the person sharing this, there's again, intentionality in setting it up and the person being transparent. And you can bring that almost in anything that you do then. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> A great point. Yeah. Uh, so I was going to ask you about what's the what's the downside to being remote? And, and I guess I want to couple that with an extra question, which is, do you ever wish you were in an office? Is there ever something where you think, oh, if you were just in an office, this would be easy? Okay, um, long <laughs> answer. Here we go. Um, the downsides, well, of course, I'm alone here. Well, not really alone. Behind me, there's someone you can't see them, but like, not alone with my, my family, but alone with my work people, right? So that's the tricky part. And I wrote about this, um, that if you do this a long while, you get kind of isolated. It depends what personality you are, but I grave sometimes the energy of like having people just around me, not necessarily interacting with them, but having people around me, right? So Buffer pays a co-working stipend if you know that's usable again after the pandemic. And we also had a coffee shop stipend also, couldn't use it in the past year, where Buffer pays us a coffee a day and like a little pastry if we want to work from a coffee shop to be good citizens, right? But that gives me already like sitting the morning in a coffee shop just gives me such a different energy of like changing places, being somewhere else, right? So the isolation is definitely big downside. Um, and then also coupled with that is if you work across the globe, people in different time zones. Time zones are something you can't, we can't change. They are there. And, you know, if you work with the, with the team that's spread from Australia to San Francisco, it's tricky, you know, like my time from two to six every day is filled, you know, because that's where the US comes on. Well, you know, other half of the team is. So, you know, and then in the mornings you check to India and to Australia. So it's like, how do you, how do you cope with that? So then async comes in, but it's also tricky um, and with that also comes another, I wouldn't say this is a downside. This is mostly an upside if you use it well, but cultures, working with different cultures. You know, if you have problems with two people collaborating, they are from two different cultures. Like you tend to think, oh, oh this is a personality thing, right? That person can't say this or do this, but actually maybe they just grown up so differently that their ways seem really right, but they're just clashing together, right? So I'm not sure this is a downside because what I wanted to say is that it's actually an upside if you use that well and study it well, because diversity of thought is equally important as general diversity of like culture where you come from, right? So um, that in general isn't a downside. I just wanted to highlight that if you ignore it, it can become a downside. And um, now I forgot what I actually also wanted to say is, so your question, just where the downside and you uh, uh, you asked a little follow-up question what was that yeah so uh, the downside and do, do you ever wish you were oh, yes. um, back in an office yes 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 there we go of course i mean we haven't met since two years because of the pandemic we haven't met so we do generally one big retreat and one smaller one with like product teams but the last one i think was september 2019 i think so it's almost two years that i have seen some people that I work with, you know, like in real life that they're persons. Um, so yeah, I, what I would say is I don't want to work from an office, but I would want the flexibility of like maybe meeting them at some point again. And this is where I said, Oh, long answer, because now with the pandemic, I think the, 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 the reality changed a bit and, you know, all the companies had to consider it. And now people great want to want to have more remote work. Well, I think remote work isn't necessarily the right word. It was until now, but I do think the more important part is it's flexible work. I mean, Buffer could have an office. We have an office. Well, it's just, um, you know, where you put in the letters. That's just in San yeah. Francisco. There's a little, little, little uh, letter case there. Um, I would want an office that could be there, but I, I'm not, you know, I don't have to be forced there. Like that's what I think will be the future where 
companies have offices, people work there whenever they want to, but others maybe only work from home all the time because our work always happens in here. And so if we're getting good at how this happens, how leadership management's happen here, I can tomorrow decide, oh, let me go into the office to meet you know, Susan to actually talk about that. Awesome. Uh, so... How do you, in your team, because um, everyone's remote, how do you evaluate performance of your developers? Is it purely down to, you know, the pull requests they they put in? Is it, uh, do you track productivity? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And I feel like this is a, a question like tabs and spaces for engineers, right? Like companies <laughs> yeah. track performance like this, others like this. Um of course, remote work is very outcome-based, right? Like it's not how many hours you spend on it. If you can deliver and do the work, that's fine. And we all probably know this. Um, starting from the top, one big thing we do is performance reviews. We just did one every six months. Um, and this is, it sounds scarier than it is. Most of, time, most of the times, and that's what I tell my direct reports and what they also experience is, there shouldn't be any surprises because we chat weekly if there's something you need to know about that's not working or it's working well, you know about this in a week's time, right? So performance reviews are there just for the papers. We'll do them, we'll reflect, right? We do a self-review, we get a review from our manager. Um, we do also sometimes 360s where you get a review from your peers. So you get a full view of like how your work is perceived. And that's kind of like the lighthouse when it comes to performance. Um, then there's, of course, giving feedback, giving praise. That happens on a regular basis, right? However you want it. Maybe you want it written in a video call. So that's also kind of a way of tracking performance and looking at it. And then, of course, does your team or do the engineers ship on time? You know, And if not, what's the problem? And can we look at that? So that's, of course, also something to look at. Don't look at PRs. We do have a tool that it's more high level. It's called uh, Code Climate Velocity, where you can like look at team's performances. How fast are they doing PR reviews? But I'm not using that as a review or performance tracking tool. It's more like, are there any roadblocks? Are there problems with the teams, right? So um, I think if your team ships and if you get into a groove of shipping and you get them motivated and there's a transparent, vulnerable relationship, you don't have to track every day's work of like, oh, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you didn't do this. This is all, again, coming down to transparency and seeing what's happening already in, you know, real life or like in, in life, basically. I definitely like that. I like that idea of, you know, uh, allowing that freedom and allowing people to, to um, prove it on their own uh, terms, essentially. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I really, really like that. Um, so... At some stage, and I guess it's it's one of the questions that I get asked a lot, and uh, I always like to put somebody else in, in the hot seat and answer the difficult question I get. So it's all around that subject of what is a senior developer and how does one become a senior developer? What's the thing? And at some point, someone noticed that in you um, and you made that transition and the rest is history. So what 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 do you look for? What 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 is that? that quality, that, um, that thing that people can do to show that they're ready for that senior move or ready for that management move? Well, you're asking me like, how much time do we have? Like this is just 10 more minutes, I think. Um, there's a tough but interesting question which I like to talk about. Um, maybe let's start with engineering first and then we can go into management. But I do think the step from for us, it's engineer three, but like an experienced engineer to a senior engineer, I think is the most important one in that career. Because as I said before, that's where big shift happens. And I don't think this is a technical thing. Technical things as an engineer, you always learn and forget because, you know, technology changes next year. It might be something else this year. It's that, right? So this is, this is already something you'll have to do nonetheless, wherever you are. But it's that shift of where you look. And this goes into, I don't want to go too deep here, into systems thinking, right? Like as an engineer, even until, you know, being an experienced engineer, you look a lot on like, hey, what are the skills I can learn? You know, what's the technology I can learn? What's the libraries I can use? You look a lot in yourself, like where can I improve? And that switch then to senior changes that view. And that did it. You can use my example if we want to go into management, but you know, if it's a senior manager at that point, and I was at the beginning more of a senior lead, 
that happened because what I did is I raised my hand and I said, hey, what's with the team? What's with the mobile team? And that is that switch where you start to know either that person or you are ready to approach senior because you're looking outside. You're not caring only about you. Even as a senior, you stop caring about the team and how you can unblock the others, how you can move them forward without even being asked. You're seeing things already, right? Like I rely so much on the senior engineers that I have in my team, whether they're senior one or senior two, because we have the differentiation because they, they need to do all the technical work. They need to tell me, I can't, I can't be in the code, right? They, they need to tell me, they need to be aware of things changing. So I think that's a crucial thing that happens of like, you start to think either about the team or about the business more, less about yourself, which doesn't mean you shouldn't care about yourself. You still do. But I think that that is the switch where everything happens. Yeah, excellent. I mean, I've always liked years ago, people used to talk about a junior developer coming on and being um, dependent. They need somebody to show them around, to, to tell them what to do. And then eventually you, you learn the platform you're developing, you learn your tools, you become independent. And that's where people stop. And then the next step is to become interdependent and utilize everyone. And it's kind of the similar vein to you're looking inward, you're looking at your code, and then you start to look out uh, and your perspective changes and you're looking more towards the team. Yeah, I love totally. It. I mean, I don't have, you know, slides here or can draw, but if you consider it like a systems thing, right? You have one circle, that's you. And then suddenly you realize there's actually a bigger circle around you, which is your team. And then suddenly you realize there's actually, actually much bigger circle, which is the company, right? And sometimes we get hung up in those like fights, oh, this team gets that resource or why can't they unblock us? It's always us. But ultimately, if you look at the big picture, it's about the company and they probably do the right thing of making money and giving you a job, right? So there's a lot in there to unpack and we could probably talk about this for another hour. But I think that's where everything starts, where like that shift from you know the inside to the outside happens. Yeah, that, that, that circles idea that... It's something that came up only yesterday talking about um, the way companies present themselves and they're always talking about raising funding or you know the success of the company, the, the, the monetary valuation of the company, um, those sorts of things. And the developers on their CVs talk uh, about the things that developers care about. Like I've, I've got knowledge of this language, this framework, this thing. And there's, there's a different the you know the companies are trying to attract the developers and the developers want to attract the attention of the companies but they're talking about very different things because they've got that lens that circle that that they're operating within you need to look at the the next circle to work out what do they want what's what's the thing that interests them yeah I yeah love totally that idea. that's what i said I at the beginning that. right the technology is kind of important to get in but it's also making sure like, how can you serve that company, right? Like how can you add value to that? And um, yeah, I think what you said definitely makes a lot of sense. I like that. Awesome. So we do have our um, hot takes questions that I want to ask towards the end, which I know you're uh, excited about. Uh, but uh, before that, we did have a question uh, that's been sent through to me. So returning back to the interview uh, conversation we were having, in a behavior interview, what personality or characteristic do you expect? Um, could you present uh, your some of your ideal answers? So what, what sort of things would you expect to see in a, a behavioral personality interview? In behavioral pulse? In the, well, I think it all comes down to like, get a, am I getting a feeling that this is you or are you pretending to be someone, you know? Um, there's of course certain, like we when we do interviews, or like role interviews, let's say, let's, let's say like that. Um, we do have a table of like ideal answers and like pause answers, but the pause answers are always like, oh, uh, would never do code review or like very abstract things that likely you won't say, but they're there for us to kind of get an idea of where you're at, right? And there's no like, that's what I always start with in interviews. There's no right or wrong answer. There is a field of answers that you can give that tells us what you think about this, but there's no right or wrong. So when it comes to behavioral or personality is like, be yourself. And even there was recently also chat on Twitter. It's like, start the meeting with like, hey, sorry, I'm very nervous. Maybe I'll move a little bit, but like tell that, like that just shows so much vulnerability. And I would hear that in the first one minute, I would be like, 
oh, you know what? Come down. It's all good. And then this would set this whole interview up for like a totally different way, you know, like, so I don't think it's necessarily about the questions. It's more about how you approach them and tell them like, honestly, like, Hey, something I haven't thought about, you know, this is a good way, but let's do a conversation. You know, like you, you don't have to have the answers for everything, but be yourself and be, be honest. I think that, even the word, the vulnerability of it is is a powerful concept. And I think um, I talk a lot to developers about uh, the interview and uh, there's a definite um, anxiety around having the right answers. And I think sometimes it's better to um, not have the right answers, but engage in a discussion, because if you're going to be working as a developer for a company, then um, you're not going to have the answers and you're going to have to talk to each other and collaborate to find the answer together. So that's more of a real world scenario than someone asking you a question and you delivering an answer, it's just not the way yeah. the world works. So if you can show your vulnerability and say, I don't know the answer, and then engage in a conversation to get to the answer together. How you would get there? Person... Yeah. Totally, totally. Exactly that. Yeah. But being able to show your vulnerability, as you say, is, is the, the core basis of that. Sounds yeah, easy, so. but it's not. I know that. But um, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. And this builds like immediate trust because a lot of people think, oh, I can only trust this person, you know, or I can only be vulnerable once I trust that person. But it's actually not the case. It's about showing small vulnerability steps that creates that trust. Yeah. And you leave and a I mark. Like to say, mm, I like to say, you know, it's rare that people hire someone they don't like. So building that trust. There you is, go. Is the, the step to that. Yeah. Powerful things. <laughs> so um, the hot take questions. Uh, didn't want to miss these off the end. Uh, no Please. pressure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, we'll start with what's the number one thing a manager in a remote team should and shouldn't do? Yeah, no, you've got me. Um, well, the first thing I, I hate to bring it back to the it's not one thing, but I'll, I'll put it into one thing is be open, be, you know, honest and be vulnerable. Like if you say, oh, I messed up, we'll change the team, you know, or the, the relationship with them. So vulnerability, I hate to come back to it. Super important. What you shouldn't do is um, hmm, what you shouldn't do. I think it all comes down also to micromanagement and to check on people to not leave them the freedom to work on things, right? To, to take away things that could help them grow, right? That comes also into delegation, but there's a little circle where you could end up with like, you want to feel important. That's why, you know, I'll take care of this. Let me handle this. And they come to you, ask for your help, but you take all of those things will end up in them not growing because you take all of the things. So um, yeah, that's, that's maybe one thing you shouldn't do. Excellent. What are the top three non-technical skills a remote developer should have? I think we've covered some of them already. Yeah, but... we covered some of them. So communication in whatever way. So let's say number one is written communication should be good. Number two, even just basically learn how to listen better. Let the silence sit. Don't jump to conclusions. Don't give advice immediately. Number two. Number three um again be open and be vulnerable like even as a developer tell when you don't know something ask for help those three things i think would be something i would say awesome. again they're hot seats maybe afterwards i'll think about something else but i would say them now <laughs> of course so this the last one's going to be interesting if you could go back if you could give a younger marcus one piece of critical advice what would it be? Uh, career advice. What would it be? Oh, existential question here. Um, give me one second to think about this. I mean, one thing that I would say to me, even now, if that works, like the younger self could even be the one from yesterday, you know. <laughs> um, but even to engineers and even to my younger self as an engineer is take your time. Like, I know there's engineers that are, you know, 30 that want to be staff engineer tomorrow, but there's still like 30 years of work, maybe depends, you know, of your work life in front of you. 
what will you do if you tomorrow already at the end of the letter? You know? So I think taking your time and um, reflecting, that's one thing I learned also, reflecting a lot about your actions. That's awesome. Well, that, that concludes my <laughs> questions, uh, uh, the grilling for, for, for today. But so how, how about you outside of, outside of Buffer? Is there anything you know, you're working on? Because uh, I know people in Buffer always have side gigs and uh, fun things going on. Is there anything uh, that, that would be of interest and you want to talk about? Um, yeah, I mean, why not? I have a website, which is just my name.com. So you can go there, Marcus, and I, I write a fair bit articles, you know, I'm just sharing a few bits and pieces there. I'm working on it a lot right now. So there's a newsletter you can sign up. It's around 30 people just now, but I send it out every Monday. Um, it's, you know, basically content that helps you become a better leader links that I add my comment about, you know, tools. So I think it's very interesting and it's very insightful. So please, you can subscribe. But the main big thing I'm working on is I'm, I'm writing a book that could also be interesting to, you know, engineers that are more geared maybe towards leadership and senior. Um, but the book, uh, basically little description is making virtual leadership more human. So um, hopefully I'm wrapping this up in the next few months. <laughs> it's not easy, you know, writing is, isn't one of my first number one skills, but um, I'm looking forward to this. So you can, you know, keep updated if you subscribe, but yeah, that's one big thing I'm, I'm working on. Well, as a subscriber to the newsletter, I can wholeheartedly give my endorsement <laughs> to that. I think that's super valuable. And honestly, I can't think of anyone better to write the book. You, you've certainly lived the life, you know, and that's what people want <laughs> is that, that real world experience for it. So, yeah, very much looking forward to that. Um, the, the last thing really, Marcus, is to say thank you. I've really enjoyed having our uh, chat. I've uh, really enjoyed the conversation. As you said, there's lots of things we could talk a lot more about. And hopefully, we, maybe we can in the future. I'd, I'd love to do this again sometime. But yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, same for me. Thanks for inviting me. I really loved our conversation. Very, very organic, very natural. So loved your questions. Thanks for having me. And yeah, why not do it again at some point about another topic? So very happy to do so. That's awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us uh, via the YouTube Live. I hope you've got as much uh, information from this and, and an enjoyment as I have. Uh, I hope you'll join us for future events. We'll be uh, hoping to meet people even half as insightful as, uh, as Marcus. That would be great. And uh, as Marcus said, um, you can uh, speak to him via his website and subscribe to his newsletter. Uh, also, you can find me in the art community if you've got any questions around remote work or um, software development work, that side of things, finding uh, software development jobs, remote jobs. I'd love to see you in the art community. But uh, Marcus, thanks again and take care, everyone.